We still have never left this room to go score somewhere else. I think he feels safe when we're in my studio and orchestra for the big scenes in this head, like 35, 45 people. I can't remember exactly how many tracks are on it. And we had to like um, record people by tag team, you know, in this little room over here. This is the room. There were many people here that, that, uh, that played for the benefit of Wes Anderson movies over the years. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's, but it is jerry-rigged. It's like in that room over there that's dark right now, we'll stick a bassoon player or an oboe player and shut them off in there. And then the piano player's over in this little room over here on the other side. And uh, we make do. It's really meant for a small group of people to work. And so, you know, it took us like two or three days to record what you could have done for three in three hours in a Sony soundstage or something like that. Get a 50-piece orchestra in uh, for uh, for Life Aquatic. Um, not all at once. I was ready to go to a bigger orchestra for uh, Royal Tannenbaums. It was kind of bugging me because you know it was kind of weird that we were using little. We were just growing, a, you know, a little bit of orchestra at a time. And I, I had been doing these other films with 110-piece orchestras over in London, and I just thought, oh my God, if if Wes ever gets to do that with me, if we ever go over to London and we use a big orchestra. It's such a, you know, it's such a rush to hear that many people playing your music. But on the other hand, it sounds very unique because of it. it everything then became very close mic'd and it became uh, a special sound that didn't really, it doesn't really sound like other orchestras necessarily. Even if they don't tell you this, here's what composers think about when songs are put in movies. They hate them. And the biggest reason why is because the songs are usually, you know, a record company wants to make that a hit single. Well, what do they want to do? Their interests are, they say, well, you got to put it, you know, at the most dramatic part of the movie. You got to put it somewhere really important. So it's like, you're like, so they carve out these big, important chunks of the film, and you're left with helping, you know, the weaker scenes of the film where they go, hey, you know, everybody was tired that day, and uh, can you put something in that speeds up the, the scene, you know, or can this this guy was supposed to be, you know, menacing in this scene, and he, and he you know, didn't do his work, so can you put something dark in to, so that people know you're not supposed to be laughing at him? Oftentimes when songs are chosen for movies, they come from the school of pun or the school of... of non-ironic lyrics where you know it's like you know if somebody you know is, is putting on a bow tie somewhere they go and have this software where they can go uh he's putting on a red bow tie and then they look for a song and it doesn't matter if it's slayer or if it's allison krauss or if it's the beatles or if it's henry mancini if if somebody wrote a song that has those lyrics in it they'll try and put it in the movie and it's it's embarrassing wes is really the mastermind behind you know, the the song choice for his films. He takes such care in what songs he puts in his movies. I think that's why his soundtracks get such a uh, such a good critical response from people. Songs aren't your favorite thing as a composer. But on the other hand, I gotta say, I think it was a stroke of genius to have the Portuguese versions of the David Bowie songs in this movie. He's kind of like a Greek chorus where he comments on the action throughout the film and, and you keep coming back to this guy. And there's these songs that are familiar, but you're like, is he speaking in tongues? What the hell's going on? The score has a slightly different function than the songs. You know, the songs, you know, like underline specific scenes and the score is kind of like a thread that holds things together. It's interesting though, I gotta say though, that that's contradicted with this movie with Sao George. It's almost like it's one piece. I think it's all acoustic guitar and one voice on all of those Bowie songs. Working with Wes reminds me of what it was like to be in Devo in the early days. It was 1973, I think. We had read something in Popular Mechanics that they said, laser discs. Everybody will have them next year. I remember seeing a picture of it, and it was the exact same size as an LP, but it not only had sound, it had vision. Oh, my God. I remember thinking, this is the death of rock and roll. Rock and roll can, can die, and we're gonna, something new is going to happen, and I want to be part of it. And that's, that's how the Devo guys felt. We, we thought that 
sorry for all these people that play rock and roll because we're going to do something different and we're going to do something new. We're doing sound and vision. We'd make these short films and we didn't know what to do with them, so we'd put them in film festivals. And we were thinking of people like Andy Warhol. You know, he 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 was a photographer, a filmmaker, a painter. He designed clothes. He produced the Velvet Underground. And something about Wes, his energy, and the way he worked, and and the people that that he brought around him, it made me feel like it was the middle 70s again. It made me feel like how I felt like when we were just so excited about doing the art, you know, and, and something about working with Wes, his enthusiasm, I, I identified with that energy and, and like the Wilson brothers were so excited when they first came out here and, and, were, and they did Bottle Rocket and I liked the people that were, that were around him and he seemed so unaffected, you know.